I'm back. Um, we made our way all the way up to the academy building itself. And now I'm going to start uh, the second part of this lecture. The first part covered um, uh, Antony's characterization of the difference between um, her view and Schiemann's view. They're both feminist epistemologists, uh, but not the way that Schiemann uses that word. Schiemann uses feminist epistemologists to pick out a certain type of um, epistemological theory, one that denies that we should be doing S knows that P epistemology, for example, um, denies individual, sorry, individualism. If you go back a few lectures, the, one of the things she says is that, um, uh, feminist epistemology is anti-individualist. That's like one of the things that I think Anthony disagrees with, for example, I think that she thinks we can do good epistemology that's individualist. So, okay, anyway, so I did that, and then we covered the first charge against classical epistemology. Um, that charge, again, is that the foundational concepts are biased. And Anthony's reply to that charge was, um, the concepts are fine. We should be free to use them, and in fact, we should use them. That's the best way to sort of go after uh, the kind of equality that we are trying to achieve as feminists or social justice advocates starting to rain. I have an umbrella and a waterproof hood. Okay, so the second charge, uh, just, just to remind us, what, what she's doing, this is like a really good philosophical structure. In many essays sort of follow this kind of structure. But you identify your opponent's arguments against your view, you disarm those arguments, you attack the arguments, show that the arguments don't give a reason to reject your view, and then you go ahead and give arguments for your view. So we're still in the first phase of that, addressing the arguments or the charges against Antony's view. So the second charge is that um, the way that traditionally has, uh, sorry, the way that epistemology has traditionally been done functions ideologically. That is, it functions in a way that uh, further marginalizes people, reinforces structures of oppression, justifies hierarchies of the social order that are the kinds of things that feminists and anti-racists want to oppose. So Anthony takes a different tact with this objection. She doesn't say, uh, that's false, it's not an ideology, it doesn't, doesn't do that. She says, no, I agree that it does. Um, but I don't think that that means we have to rethink classical epistemology. We can acknowledge that it's ideological and that it functions to marginalize, further marginalize people who already are. Um, we can agree that it, it, it serves this ideological function without abandoning classical epistemology altogether. Oh, my handle broke off. My handle fell, of uh, my purple umbrella fell right into these violets. Almost. Um, I have a photo of violets as my phone background. Okay. Shoot, I forgot where I was. Right, so one reason you might think that it's sort of a suspect move or something to be worried about, something that Shima might be worried about, is that if um, the framework of classical epistemology is constructed in a way that, that makes it sort of unavoidably um, biased, then this would be a bad project. Like, how could you maintain the classical epistemological approach um, while also opposing the ideological function of the theory, if the ideology is sort of built into the structure of the theory, which is what Schiemann thinks. But this sort of, this, this uh, dovetails with the other response because um, Anthony doesn't think that the concepts are inherently biased. She thinks that we can have a sort of neutral uh, generalizations of like rationality and knowledge that are not going to recapitulate the biases of the people who created those concepts. And so if she's right, then it does, it, it seems like it should be at least a, a viable thing to try 
to keep classical epistemology intact while also trying to stop it from functioning in this ideological way that it has been to deny people, you know, access to the sorts of things that, that denials of rationality have been used to deny, for example. So, Anthony has three replies to this uh, charge. So what I was just talking about is the first um, part of the reply to charge two, which says that the concepts of traditional uh, epistemology are totally consistent with the claim that uh, that says um, epistemology has served as ideological function. Which is like the old-fashioned idea of like rationality, the old-fashioned idea of a knowing subject. S knows that P epistemology, you can believe in that while still thinking that, that uh, the way that epistemology has been thought about and deployed has marginalized people. So that's the first aspect. Um, um, the second aspect is, uh, she says, all the criticisms of science, um, bad science, like racist science, for example, the criticisms of racist science don't show, they don't show that we can't um, use the concepts of traditional epistemology to criticize wrong thinking, like racist thinking in sciences. Anthony's point is, actually, that's what we're, that's what we do. Um, traditionally, anyway, the way you effectively criticize science as racist is you show that it's not, that it doesn't live up to the standards, the objective value neutral standards of the scientific enterprise. Um, so like a lot of the examples I was giving uh, in the code lectures about how scientific um, studies, the reasons under for which they shouldn't be um, trusted when they deliver, for example, like racist uh, conclusions. I mean, nothing I said there really, according to to uh, Anthony anyway, none of those criticisms uh, really requires that you abandon the traditional kind of epistemology. You can make those same criticisms while maintaining the, the sort of S knows that P generic subject of knowledge, for example. This is the part in the paper where Anthony says, by the way, uh, the, <laughs> the ideal of value neutrality has never even been successfully attempted. So she's like, we have all kinds of science that's very biased, but what that shows us is that we should work harder to get less biased and, and try to produce better science. We have never gotten to the place where we are making science that's value neutral. So, so she agrees sort of with Schiemann's idea that says um, people use the, the notion of value neutrality as a shield and she thinks that's bad. In other words, if a racist science study hides behind the idea like these facts don't have feelings, these are just the facts. Um, Anthony's reply to that is, no, they're not. That's not good science. In fact, I'll show why this study or that study is, um, is wrong. <clears throat> or at least that's the proper way to go about criticizing those kinds of theories. So just because we've never managed to achieve value neutral science yet in the history of science, if you think that's true, like Anthony might, um, that doesn't mean it's not a good goal or something we should stop trying for. Whereas Schiemann thinks it's impossible, maybe something like this, it's impossible to create something which is totally devoid of the fingerprints of your own social identity, your own culture, worldviews, and stuff like that, your own ethical presuppositions, ideas about social reality, or regular old reality. <laughs> All right, the third aspect of her criticism of the second charge, in other words, she's got three criticisms of charge two. Um, <clears throat> she says, you know, if, if objectivity is impossible, um, then what is the point of searching out or seeking out and eliminating bias in sciences and in epistemology anyway? So this is, I think, a concern that uh, many of you probably have had. At, at times, like hearing the code and the Schiemann stuff, um, there's all this consideration, these considerations we talked about of how the role of objectivity is sort of um, imperiled by the recognition that all of epistemology is politicized, including claims about objectivity. And so I think here Anthony's trying to give voice to that worry. Like if you've done, if you've done in the concept of objectivity, 
what is the rationale for trying to um, criticize the political implications or the political biases of various groups in their science and then and in, in their epistemology um this one i think maybe they all have clear responses from Scheman. i'm not trying to prejudge the case but this one i think has a, a more straightforward one that's coming right out of the conversation about what objectivity is for on Scheman's view so objectivity for Scheman is a matter of getting closer to removing these biases uh closer to objectivity. So in other words, ob objectivity is still a guiding ideal. It's just not something that's achievable. It's like a limit that is way off on the horizon permanently. It's like the horizon. You're sort of headed for it. You can orient toward it, but you can't reach it. So it's not that objectivity or the concept of more objective, less biased, those things still play a role. Um, now, I think... Anthony could um, press the issue and say, well, um, but in the details of the Schumann account, the way I was presenting it, the way that I, I take Schumann to mean it, um, even your attempts to get less biased, um, that orientation, which way is the horizon, which way is up, which way is better, is politically loaded. So there's no way out of that uh, condition. What you think of as objective is partly conditioned by your identity and your politics. And I think that Schumann has to accept that. And then the question is, what do you say back to that? And this is where I think another part of the, the response that I had thought about and talked about earlier comes in, which is, you know, if Schumann's right, if Code is right, and there's no way to get away from your... Uh, constitution as a social being um, it doesn't it's sort of the best we can do is to a, a, approach what we think of as objectivity from our situated perspective um, now does that mean that we have to recognize that our own perspective is flawed I think it does to some extent mean that we should always be checking in with our own um understanding as best we can to make sure that we're not being guided by biases. And in that sense, we can't escape the project of using our political tool, our political critical tools in investigating our own perspective and our own inferences, our own theories. So <clears throat> the thing I think that's the crux of the objectivity issue is that uh, you, it's never legitimate to simply declare, I am bias free. <laughs> My theory is value neutral. Um, anytime anyone does that, they're in bad faith, whether they know it or not. They're sort of pulling something. <laughs> uh, yeah. By the way, you can see that these two views sort of narrow in toward each other. I think this is a sign of, of the sense in which these two philosophers are on the same side. They're sort of getting closer and closer to meeting in the middle, even though they are sort of... Uh, keeping their distance still in the theoretical space. Okay, so that's, that's my complete um, presentation of Antony's replies to charges one and two. The last thing I want to talk about are her, her two positive arguments um, sort of fit together. Um, <clears throat> the first one is what I was saying is an empirical argument, and it comes from... Uh, something like cognitive psychology and neurobiology. And the idea is that humans are more alike in more significant ways than we are different when it comes to our uh, existence as knowledge producers, seekers. Um, that's what, this has to do with what I was, what, what she calls human cognitive universals. So they're universal attributes that all, or all regular, all normal. Here you get this same critique of the she. The, sh the same critique that she even raises against this normalness is rearing its head again. Like if someone's not normal, then they're not. They don't have the usual human capacities. There's like this disability type uh, objection here. Anyway, the view that Anthony likes is that there are a lot of properties that humans have in common that are the quintessential, crucial properties to investigate 
Uh, and this is stuff like, how does vision work? How does audition work? How do we reason? How does the brain work? Um, how does memory work? And if we can give objective, empirical, scientific descriptions of how these systems work, then we've gone a long way toward understanding how knowledge is acquired in a way that doesn't have anything to do with politics because biology doesn't have anything to do with politics and psychology doesn't have anything to do with politics. Um, so to the extent that you think you can do value-neutral science, you should also think you can do value-neutral science of the human organism and its epistemological abilities, its, its uh, natural epistemic properties. So it's kind of bound up with this uh, question. Can you do a value-neutral psychology? Can you do a value-neutral biology? Or is even in the attempt to formulate these theories, you're um, sort of importing biases about what counts as a normal organism? Or which, you know, another aspect of this, I think that can be raised, is kind of a weird one, but um, which, so when we think of a visual system as functioning accurately, part of what's built into that is assumptions about what reality is, including. So if I am seeing things, seeing people and beings around me that nobody else sees, then there's an imperative to explain why my vision and my biology is abnormal, such that I'm having these abnormal experiences. Um, in other words, there's a presupposition, I'm malfunctioning. I'm not functioning normally, I'm not functioning correctly, and therefore my deviance is causing me to be less than fully rational or less than a fully apt uh, cognizer, agent of knowledge. Okay, so the emp empirical argument stands and falls uh, with the question of whether or not you can produce a um, bias-free, value-neutral science of the human organism. Can you produce a value-neutral, unbiased scientific theory of the human organism and its epistemic capabilities? Uh, that is sort of sufficient to uh, do epistemology with. If you think yes, then you're with Anthony in thinking that there are these human cognitive universals and that we can scientifically investigate them in a way that allows us to sort of cut biases out of our science. The last argument she gives, which is this pragmatic argument, I think of it as a pragmatic argument, she says something like, I would be very disappointed if I found out that there is no such thing as universal human rationality because I think that that is a good basis on which to ground our social justice uh, movements. So she thinks that the, the human cognitive universals, the fact that we're all rational, that we all have similar minds, is the surefirest, best, historically tested grounds on which to pursue equality and justice in the law and in the in this social organization of our society and in people's uh, views of each other. Um, and she thinks giving up on the, on the project of um, doing that, basically if, if we think with Schumann and Code that rationality itself is inherently problematic concept, then we can't pursue social justice projects on the grounds that we're all rational or that we're all alike in our mental lives or something like that. That the, Even that claim is going to be importing some kind of political biases, something like that. Standing under this, uh, sorry, I don't have to use my umbrella to give this lecture. It's very convenient. Just sort of walking the perimeter. <laughs> um, yeah, so <clears throat> that's kind of where we're going to end. I guess the question to leave you with is... Um, is it true that the shared universal rationality is the right way to pursue justice? I mean, suppose that you find a person or a group of people who don't live up to the human cognitive universal standards uncovered by a cognitive science, like mentally handicapped person, child, animals. I mean, anything that doesn't sort of live up to that mold, whatever it is that's set forth in the ideal, <laughs> idealized human cognitive capacity established by whatever science is supposed to do this neurobiology or cognitive science or something. Anyway, if, the idea is that if you, if you set up that as the standard by which justice should be measured, you're going to end up leaving out a bunch of people. Um, so is it really smart to stake the social justice project, the social justice endeavor on... <laughs> is, it, is it smart to stake 
the social science and uh, sorry, is it smart? Let me start again. Is it smart to stake the social justice movements on the empirical existence of a universal rational capacity? Um, one worry is you could leave some people out. Some people might not live up to it. It also, it sort of, <laughs> weirdly, it, it, it lends support to these um, scientific racist projects. So there, if, if you think that that is the basis for seeking social equality, the other side of the coin is if it doesn't exist, if empirically someone turns out to be less rational than someone else, then by your own presupposition, that justifies a social order. <laughs> If, 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 equal, if equality in cognitive capacities somehow were necessary precondition on social equality, um, then a science of rationality could be the basis for organizing the society in unequal ways. I think that the logic checks out. <laughs> Maybe not. Yeah, what's sufficient? What's necessary? All right, I'm going to end here, and you can go check that thought <laughs> and see what you think. All right, it's been a pleasure. I hope that you all have learned a lot. I've had a lot of fun making these videos. Um, good job persevering under adverse conditions uh, this semester. I think that we made a lot of this class, even though it was not so easy for everybody to sort of pull together. I think we did it. So, all right, thank you, and I'll see you around.